think my mic's dead, boys, so we'll just use this one right here. It'll be fine with me. Good morning, and I thank you for the opportunity to discuss God's Word with you. Danny read this morning from Ecclesiastes 12th chapter, verse 13. And I would like to discuss one concept of that very important verse, and that is the concept of duty. I'm afraid that in society today we're losing the concept of duty, just like we're losing the concept of responsibility, respect, discretion, and shame. Too often we are hung up, as people like to say, on our legal rights, the license that we have to do something. We're concerned about ourselves and quick fixes. I certainly don't know, but I think part of the contributing factors to this is that we have shifted duties from individuals to the government. Uh, we have programs now that take care of people when in the past that was our responsibility to look after our neighbors and our families. We don't have to do that in some parts anymore. I think that urbanization, the change of our society from an agricultural society to urban societies, has removed the closeness that we had with neighbors and friends and the concepts that were involved therein. And I think to some extent our attention to financial gain has diverted us from the concept of duty. Spiritually speaking, duty is that which is made mandatory by God. That's your definition. If you would turn to Luke the 17th chapter, verses 9 and 10. Jesus is teaching, and as is his custom, he talks about service and uses a parable. And if you back up really to Verse 7, he says, Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, Come now and sit down to eat? Would he rather not say, Prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also... When you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. The concept of duty is inextricably woven within the pages of the Holy Bible. And we're going to look at some of the examples of that this morning. But... What Jesus was teaching in verse 17 helps to govern what our attitude ought to be toward our duty. I've only done that which, was I, which I was commanded to do. In fact, Jesus says later, as recorded in the book of John, chapter 15, verse 14, if you, you are my friend, you are my friend, if you do, what I command. So our attitude toward duty needs to be that of I'm only doing that which I'm supposed to do, and if I do it, then I'm a friend of Jesus. And obviously what Jesus taught in the New Testament determines what our duty is. In Colossians the third chapter in verse 17, it is recorded by the Apostle Paul that whatever we do in word or deed, do all 
in the name of the Lord. That's our authority for whatever our duty it is. The performance of our duty is based on two key factors. The first one is ability. If you remember the parable recorded in Matthew, the 25th chapter, servants were given, some servants were given five talents, some two and some one. But each was given those talents according to their ability. If you don't have the ability to do something, then that's not your duty. So God gives us our duties based on our talents, based on our abilities. And the second key factor is opportunity. We're told in Galatians 6.10, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. <clears throat> there are many, many critical duties that we have as New Testament Christians. The first preacher that College View had in this pulpit, Curtis Flat, had some 10 lessons on duties. And I thank him this morning for recording those. They were a great help in preparing this lesson. So my glazing over them this morning will not do justice to how important that they are. But the spiritually imposed duties that we have as New Testament Christians begin with our duty to God. We have a duty to God to keep His commandments. We have a duty to love our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. We have a duty to worship God as recorded in Matthew, the fourth chapter and verse 10. We have a duty to honor God. We have a duty to fear God. We have a duty to trust God. We have a duty to praise God. And we have a duty to reverence God. And that just skims the surface. We as New Testament Christians have a duty to Christ. We have a duty to hear Christ. We have a duty to receive Christ. We have a duty to believe Christ. We have a duty to confess His name. We have a duty to obey Him. We have a duty to be baptized into Him and to follow His example. There are a myriad of verses that would instruct us in each one of those duties to Christ, obviously time will not permit. We as New Testament Christians have a duty to the Word, the Word of God. We have a duty to hear it. We have a duty to search it and study it and rightly divide it. Let's turn to 2 Timothy, the second chapter. As you all know, I'm really into visual aids, so you'll just have to turn your Bibles with me and read. 2 Timothy, the second chapter, and verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. We have... Another duty to God, uh, to the Word, not only to know it, but we have a duty to, to keep it and to do what it says. I think James addresses that so well in James, the first chapter, in verse, beginning in verse 22. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away 
and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. The duty to do what it is that the Word says that you need to do. Christians have a duty to a non-Christian. Christians have a duty to teach and to be examples to those round about us so that they will see Christ living in us. There's so many ways to accomplish this, whether it be by your example, whether it be one-on-one, -on -one, whether it be in a class. And I'm struck at the opportunities afforded us today by what is called social media. And I think often how good it would be if there was more on there about what being a Christian entails uh, than what I had to eat for supper. Uh, it is a great tool that we can use as New Testament Christians to show others the way to Christ. We have a duty to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We have the duty to edify the duty that's talked about in 1 Corinthians 3, thir excuse me, 13, to love. We have the duty to comfort. We have the duty to financially assist, if that be the case. It is talked about in James, the second chapter, verses 14 through 16. And then there are special categories within the brotherhood. And that is the duties that we have to those younger and those older. Turn, if you will, to Titus, the second chapter, <clears throat> beginning in verse 3. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way that they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. We also have duties to widows and orphans. If you turn over to 1 Timothy, the fifth chapter, verses 4 and verse 8, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, they should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. Verse 8, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and worse than an infidel. There are duties that members of the local congregation have to elders. If you look in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, and begin in verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard, in love, because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And then, if you will, in 1 Timothy, the fifth chapter... Verse 17, the elders who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. Verse 19, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. We have a duty toward husbands. We have a duty toward wives. If you look in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, beginning in verse 22, 
Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkles or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but feeds it and cares for it just as Christ, the church. Paul tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 13 and verse 9, that we have a duty to love our neighbors. So there are many categories, each one of which could be a lesson unto itself. New Testament Christians have a duty to their government. Paul spends the first eight verses in the book of Romans talking about submission to the governing authority. As has been pointed out before, and I think recently, Obviously, this was written at a time when there was a very tyrannical and horrible government in, in, in existence. So that ought to say to us that it doesn't matter which political party is in office. We have a duty to honor our government and to do what we are told to do, to honor the law, whether we agree with the law or not. We have a duty, believe it or not, to ourselves. Take a look, if you would, at Philippians, the second chapter, in verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in absence... <laughs> Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We have to take personal responsibility for our salvation. We can't depend on the Bible class teacher. We can't depend on the elders. We can't depend on anybody else but us to make sure that we're saved. Paul makes that very clear in his admonition to the Philippians. We have also a duty to examine ourselves. Paul tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 in verse 5 that we are to examine ourselves. And why is it that he tells us that we are to examine ourselves? If you look at that passage, again, chapter 13 and verse 5 of 2 Corinthians, he says, examine yourselves to see whether or not you're in the faith. Test yourselves. So we need to keep a check on us. Uh, just like we get a physical with our physician, we need a physical every day, spiritually, to make sure that we are in the faith. Employers and employees have duties to each other. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 5 through 9. There are duties from parents to children and from children to parents. If you would, turn over to Ephesians, the 6th chapter, verses 1 through 4. Children, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may, well go, go, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Well, there are two points as far as the responsibility of children are concerned. One is, 
you obey your parents. And obviously that takes care of when you're under their roof and you they give you a something to do, you do it. They tell you not to do it, you don't do it. But I will tell you that there is another side of that coin, and that is the concept of honoring your parents later in life. I have occasion, unfortunately, to see from time to time what happens when children don't do that. When a parent is lying in the hospital and the child won't take responsibility. When the child doesn't come check on, when the child won't make arrangements to do anything for the parent at time of discharge. The only concern that is manifested sometimes is to how best they can rifle the bank account of the parent who is lying there in the bed. That is not honoring one's parent, but I will assure you that it happens with some degree of frequency, unfortunately. The last part of what Paul talks about that is the duty is the duty on the part of the parents to the child. And you know, there's some very basic concepts there. The first one is the child didn't ask to come here. You brought them into the world. And while they're young and under your roof, you have a duty to them. You are responsible for what they hear and what they see. You're responsible for where they go. You, not their pediatrician, are responsible for their good health and safety. You can't abrogate those duties. And fundamental to that is that you've got to be there to carry out those duties. I, I think that it is said so well uh, in reference to teaching them God's Word, which is your number one or our number one duty as uh, parents. If you look in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, Verse 6, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames. You have an obligation to be with your children. You have an obligation to maximize that time, you have a responsibility to be there for them. As God said in His inspired Word. As New Testament Christians, not only do we have responsibilities to individuals and to other entities, but very importantly, we have a duty to the church to the body as a whole, to bring it home to the body here at College View. I think fundamentally it starts with having the right attitude. Jesus said in Matthew the 6th chapter in verse 33 that we are to seek first His kingdom. And if that is your attitude, then you have a great start toward your duty to the local church. You will seek first God's kingdom and what's best for it. We read earlier the passage in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses 25 and 30, about the concept of husband and wife. Well, that's one of those passages that you can read a second way that's just as important. And that is you can learn what your attitude ought to be toward the local church based upon what Christ's attitude was toward the church. What He did 
for the church. I won't read those verses again, but sometimes it's good to stop and think is, is my attitude toward the body, what Christ's attitude was toward the body, and that is that it came first. I have a duty, once I have that attitude, I have a duty to work in the local body. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 11, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, and then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. In the book of Romans, in chapter 12, verses 5 through 8. Paul says, So in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts. According to the grace given us, if a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. You remember our discussion about the five, two, and one talent people, that each was given according to his ability. This is a good illustration of it. Whatever your talent is, you have a duty. You have a duty to exercise it for not your benefit, but for the benefit of others. In this case, those people who are members here. We have an obligation also to work for unity. You remember the verse, or the passage rather, in Galatians, the third chapter, verses 26 through 29, when usually the emphasis is on the concept of oneness. But in there, Paul relates to these people about how many different kinds of folks there are. Whether you're Jew or Greek, male or female, bond or free, whatever. That lets us know that there is going to be a diverse population in the church. And we have an obligation to work through that so that there will be, as Paul called for in 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 10, unity and no division among us. Closely related there, too, is we have an obligation or a duty to support financially the work. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, Paul uh, covers that. And that covers when we agree and when we don't agree with decisions of judgment that are made, if I would have done it different or if I wouldn't have done it different. And that ties in with the, the concept of obeying our, our rulers, which is another duty that we mentioned earlier and it's talked about in Hebrews 13, 17. That duty is there to support the church, to obey those who have the rule over us, uh, and it's very easy to do when you agree with every decision of judgment that is made. But you know, when you make a decision about <coughs> discipline, when you make a decision about support, when you make a decision about a program, when you make a decision about an expenditure for the building, when you make a decision about the teaching program, you risk disagreement. So how far do I carry my disagreement? Do I pull my check? Do I quit coming? Do I stir up dissension? Hopefully I exercise my duty and I continue to support 
as taught and I continue to obey. We have a duty to this congregation to make it stronger by making ourselves stronger. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 15 and 16, Paul talks about this concept as each member and each part does its work, building up the body and making it stronger. We have a duty in the local church to discipline, to bring others back to Christ, hopefully. Why don't we carry out the duties if we're not? Well, there are a myriad of reasons. But Scripture refers to sometimes we love the praises of men. Sometimes we are respecters of persons. Sometimes we do what we do or fail to do what we ought to do because we want to be seen of men. Sometimes we are ignorant, as Paul admitted that he was at one time. Sometimes we are indifferent. We're lukewarm. And sometimes we just won't. We don't know how. We don't want to know how. And I ain't going to learn. And that keeps me from doing our duty. It could be a matter of time that we say that we don't have. It could be because of trying to accumulate wealth to keep up with self-imposed standards that society puts on me or that I put on myself because of what I see round and about. The performance of duty is not done for adulation, it is not done for self-aggrandizement. The performance of duty is doing that which God tells me that I need to do and being glad that I have the opportunity to do that. The truth of the matter is, is that if you're not a member of God's family, if you're not a New Testament Christian, then you can't perform these duties. You don't have that responsibility, you don't have the opportunity, and you sure won't reap the benefits from the performance of duties. If there's anybody with us this morning who would like the opportunity to perform your duties that God gives us to do in His Holy Word, or perhaps you have failed to perform your duties having been born again, we offer this as a time for you to take care of any situation that you might need to as we stand and as we sing.